Well, thank you for joining me at the eighth slideshow for Victory Garden. We're going to end the winter of 2012. We're going to talk about the dynamic accumulators and nitrogen fixers that we have chosen for the garden. Um, accompanying me is my trusty volume two of Edible Forest Gardens by Dave Jackie with Eric Toensmeyer. Uh, this is one of the best temperate region uh, permaculture guides that you can get your hands on. It's a bit pricey, uh, as it should be if you've ever actually held a copy. Um, it's just a phenomenal piece of work and the amount of information that they have packed into uh, the both, both volumes uh, completely makes the case for uh, agroecology and uh, using permaculture as your framework for applying all these different techniques. So let's get started. We're going to talk about uh, February 16th. We're going to run through all the way end, end February and hopefully we'll get to March 6th as well. Uh, that's where I ended the first uh, try at recording this. So this first picture, uh, here's the second year of uh, of the blueberry plants. The blueberries were just trying to get their footing into these beds. Uh, you know, some of them died, some of them lived, and the ones that lived have done extremely well, I believe, considering that this soil has never been amended. We, we, you know, we just added compost and mulch and pine straw and stuck the plants in there. Um, you can't get a commercial, as far as I know, you can't get a commercial uh, mycorrhizal fungi inoculant for blueberries. They actually have their own type of fungi that they associate with. Um, so we're hoping that maybe they actually had some carrying with them from their former site since it was like a, a blueberry farm. Uh, we are hoping, a pretty much an abandoned blueberry farm, so we're hoping that they actually have some of those fungi with them. And you can see that they're putting out some really nice growth in the second year. They're small bushes, uh, but they'll get there. They'll get larger and produce more. And these were actually produced, they were leaning. They, we actually had to kind of hold them up with some twine uh, before I left because they uh, they were going to fall over with all the blueberries that they had uh, had on them. Let's go on to another picture here. We're looking at the green guild and the first swale. Something's new here. We've got uh, a dead end now. Instead of having two open ends of the swale where uh, where you can see the fresh clay, that is where the water used to overflow and go into that overflow ditch and this is what I was talking about I don't know how many slideshows ago but I did mention that I eventually cured that um, we could I couldn't handle the amount of erosion that was going on anymore and I wanted to fix that air so I just put an elbow of clay on uh, so that the water will drain out the bottom of this uh, bottom of the screen this is where the water is going to drain out into the rest of the garden instead of being and it's going to be dispersed through the grass and slowed down by vegetation and it's not going to meet a channel where it can cause a lot of problems. Um, covering most of the green guild is white clover and why do we choose clover as a ground cover? White clover is very foot tolerant uh, so we wanted to experiment with it as a uh, multifunctional plant species for the pathways and uh, it produces quite a bit of flowers, it's perennial so it's a generalist nectary, a nitrogen fixer, and according to Edible Forest Gardens, it accumulates phosphorus, which is one of the prime nutrients that limits plant growth anywhere, and especially in our system. Our, our phosphor counts are really low, so we need to hold on to whatever we possibly can. Let's go on to another picture. Here's uh, a red clover growing really well with a lot of mulch around it. This is uh, right by the red maple. That's right by the red maple where we had thrown some red clover seeds and whichever ones came up we mulched around and uh, red clover grows a whole lot larger than white clover. It's probably foot tolerant but it's nothing you want to walk through because it does grow a few feet high um, and it's also you know, almost a year long once spring comes around it's going to produce flowers uh, throughout the year for you. Nitrogen fixer, phosphorus accumulator. Here's a closer picture of the elbow that's blocking the uh, that old drainage ditch that I had. I made it high enough so that we would we wouldn't have overflow. Uh, 
uh, it would it would definitely exit out the other side and that's what I had to do on the second swell as well here's a picture uh, from the nightshade old nightshade guild being cover cropped with the dacon radishes alfalfa it's hard to see any alfalfa in this picture especially since I can't zoom in and do so I'm not doing screencasts I'm just making a slideshow here um, alfalfa is mixed in here and alfalfa along with being a nitrogen fixer also accumulates iron so it's also retaining nutrients for us and center left you have a lemon balm bush and lemon balm accumulates phosphorus as well uh, so along with being a very good nectary plant as well as an overwintering site I mean look at how much space there is uh, with all the dead leaves and uh, branches that small insects can overwinter in it's uh, is one of the really one of the best plants you can have in the garden. It's also an aromatic pest confuser. So we've got multi functions stacked throughout the system. It's nothing like uh, somebody who's taken a PDC and been, you know, implementing these strategies uh, for years and years and years. But we are armed with a lot of information, and I tried to put that information to use. Uh, here's a picture of flowering cabbages uh, mixed in with you know some of the other fall crops that I talked about and this area is almost full sun during the winter the the shade from the house doesn't quite manage to reach all the way down to here so we saw a lot more production that's why they flowered sooner than all the other ones and speak about overwintering sites I mean look at all this this thick uh, these thick leaves and branches and everything that we've put up you know it's wonderful wonderful thing to have in your garden it looks messy to the conventional eye. I do understand that it looks messy to the conventional eye, but I completely disagree that that's any reason why. Uh, you know, beauty is important. Uh, our garden really isn't beautiful. It's, uh, I, I wouldn't think it's all that beautiful to a third party, uh, but if you understand what we're trying to do here, uh, we're working towards it. We're trying to get in some more beautiful plants uh, just for and make it visually appealing. But the first thing we, uh, first on our list is repairing the damage we've done. Uh, so beauty comes second. This is another view looking out towards the garden. How it's getting a little bit more lumpy as temperatures are increasing. Same view. Uh, center right where the horsetails are. I think I might have a closer up picture later. But horsetails are also a wonderful dynamic accumulator. Calcium, copper, iron, and magnesium. Those are some rare, more rare nutrients for a plant to accumulate, especially the copper, uh, which is one reason why it was key to plant our horsetails here, and I'm sure that we're going to transplant even more horsetails further down the watercourse. We want horsetails uh, throughout the garden where it remains wet so that they can accumulate those really beneficial nutrients and we can bring them back into the garden so they don't get completely washed out. Here's one of the little Hugh culture mounds. I've planted some garlic into it and mulched it with uh, some of these, some of this grass that I found behind the fence. It was nice and dry, and it's been the soil's been top dressed with uh, soil from the raised bed. This organic soil from the raised bed that I talked about in the first slideshow that hasn't made too many appearances because we don't use it as much. Uh, here's pretty much the same view again. Not sure why I'm including it, but. Now this is what we're working with in February. Winter time, it's a good time to find fungal, uh, you know, activity going around. Uh, usually it, it, there's a lot of fungi that emerge in the summertime as well, uh, but the winter is usually when you're going to find more of them, especially a mild winter like this. So they're breaking down some of these pine logs, uh, these big pine trees that we chopped down to make room for the blueberries our first winter. Uh, it's taken them a year, but see how they're nice and they're starting to break down. Now, we could use these for Hugo culture, but we, um, you know, the, there's a saying, let sleeping logs lie. They're there, they're going to be feeding the willow oak and some other things. So we're just going to let them be for the time. Uh, we probably won't ever move them, we'll just leave them there. We can get logs from someplace else. Here's the 17th, so the next day. Remember in the last slideshow I said that we had some interesting pictures of okra as it begins to be decomposed by the soil organisms. Well, here it is. Um, the outer layer of cells has been stripped away, and now we're seeing some of this 
the nice there's a really nice pattern uh, I don't know how this it's structured and you can imagine how water moves through uh, these cells up and down and really really neat to see it being eaten from the ground up surrounding it is chickweed which I've mentioned before is a dynamic accumulator it accumulates um, potassium as well as phosphorus so it's actually a really great but that partly explains why they grow so quickly uh, because they're better at scavenging for these nutrients than many other plants so they have an advantage while it may not fix its own nitrogen by being able to go after two of the three major nutrients you know hey that's that's going to be a good excuse for it to grow rampantly here's a little uh, I know there's a whole lot of different words for young trees so I'm not sure if this is a sapling but it is a one-year-old birch tree river birch uh, after our three birches mated together and sent off their seed, uh, they get blown in the wind and here we've got, you can actually see two, this is one of the largest ones that's in the center and there's quite a few other ones that emerge as well. So birch trees, if you've ever visited Finland, you know birch trees just produce the most seed of anything you've ever seen before in your life, it's just flying around all the time. Uh, birches are wonderful to have in your garden because they are also dynamic accumulators. The black birch is the best according to this table. Um, obviously, Dave Jackie and Eric Tonsmeyer weren't able to go and test every single species that they mentioned in the book, uh, but the ones that they do list as dynamic accumulators, they did find some evidence for. Uh, so a black birch would actually accumulate potassium, phosphorus, and calcium, so it makes it one of the best dynamic accumulating plants or trees that you can find. Uh, while all birches, according to them, are very good at taking up phosphorus. So, again, that key limiting nutrient in our garden, we have those trees and we have the three established ones and we have some young ones that we're not going to be allowing to live too long because we don't want just trees 10 feet from each other. Uh, but while they're growing, they're taking up phosphorus, so was, when, whenever we do chop them down, they're going to be in addition of fertilizer as well as carbon. Uh, here's just an image of some of the cabbages flowering, pointing towards the sun. It's so warm that even the ladybugs have emerged. Uh, it, I think everybody, almost everyone uh, in the south was kind of shaking their heads at how warm the winter was uh, through 2011, 2012. Here's a close-up of some of those cabbages. And let's pop over to the next day, which should be the 20th. Yeah, the 20th, we had some snow through the night. So it goes from warm to not so warm, but we didn't get that much snow, as you can see. It, it, this is about 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, the areas underneath the pine trees probably never even had any snow. Uh, the pine trees are so thick that they keep the flurries from reaching them. And it also helps that uh, this is the south side of the, actually, you know, the north side, the north side of the pine trees has snow, while the south side doesn't. And if you compare our property, of course, on the left, to her, to our neighbors on the right, um, it looks as if we have more area that has been uh, thawed out quicker. And I, I'm going to go on a limb and say that that's because of the pond. There's a small pond there. And then also see the swale, see that second swale. So wherever there's water, standing water that's holding heat, that's going to reduce uh, the ability for snow to linger. As well as the fact that, you know, that swale is backed up by a little berm. So a southern facing slope, sure it's a, you know, not even a foot high, but it is southern facing aspect. So you're going to see that's how micro microclimates can get. Here's just another picture from upstairs. I mean, you look at the big pit where uh, the second larger pond is, and, and that's snow-free as well. So you know, take, take that into consideration that even small micro uh, aspects create microclimates. It's just the way it is. Uh, so that's why we don't... Now we're getting into the period where we're not going to be treating the garden with broad strokes as much as we did. We learned more about the influence of shade, such as see in this picture here, the snow that's left is running along the privacy fence because the privacy fence shades all of this 
until about noon. These pictures were taken about 12.30 in the afternoon. So it was just you can see the line, how shade affects temperature and why we need to start uh, using that information we learned to put the right plants in the right location. It's going to take time. We're not going to get everything down perfectly right away, but um, you know, it's just part of observation. When the snow melts, your swales fill. Wonderful. Uh, yeah, even closer, showing you, look how thickly that snow is still nestled in around all the clover and everything else. So then we're on the left side of this picture. It's, it's almost all melted. Here's another photo, again, showing those micro aspects. Uh, this is the north side of the berm for the second swale, and it's still up and down its length, pretty much. It still has a lot more snow than if you look on the left side of it. It's melted already, so yeah. take it for what it's worth. And here you can see the fish are out. Love the fish. Uh, that south-facing slope just, you know, completely melted away already. Uh, but anything that's in the shade has still got some snow cover. <laughs> and here are the fish again. These are second-generation goldfish that we've never fed. I know besides, again, like I said, when we throw insects in there. They're always fun to watch when they come out, sit down for a little bit, and sure, they're just eating, but... Like I said, it's nice to have something colorful and something alive in your garden. That's one reason why people like to have uh, birds and everything visiting. We'll talk about birds and uh, what their uses are as well. Here we've got vetch. Uh, you can't see it as much. You're really probably being focused on the Osaka purple mustard and some of the other things in this part of the guild. But along with some clumps of red clover, uh, there's still some vetch. It's mostly brown. It, the vetch was supposed to be hardy, pretty extremely hardy. Um, obviously not how most of it's died back, but Common vetch, in association with being a nitrogen fixer, is an excellent cover crop because vetch accumulates potassium and phosphorus. So we're not just planting one type of nitrogen fixer. You're planting a multitude in order to get different benefits. And remember, different plants give different exudates to the soil. Uh, you know, the, the functions of the plants just continue to stack and this was just, this is the 23rd and 24th of March. So, no, sorry, not March, but February. So, uh, just the, that's how fast the snow disappears. That's how warm it was. So warm that the bees already came out. And here are the bees on the, some of this uh, cabbage that's flowering. That's unheard of. And with the snow, with the snow melt being nice and mild, look at how the amphibians have come out. Here are three frogs where there's just probably, I think it was the guy in the middle. I think he's been around for a while. Well, I'm not sure if it's a he, but, you know, this frog in the middle has been around for a while, and he was joined by two more. And there are even more frogs. Like, I think in the beginning of spring, we probably had at least five or six of these size bronze and green frogs jumping around, hopping around our garden, eating all the insects they can and everything else, uh, earthworms and bugs, and just really cool. I really love having small wildlife in the garden, beneficial wildlife. Here's a picture just looking down from the green guild into the garden. Uh, if you've got a really keen eye, you can see that the willow tree is beginning to leaf a little bit. Um, and the maple, let's talk about the maple for a second. All maples, according to Edible Forest Gardens, accumulate potassium. You know, just another reason why uh, research is not, I mean, we were, I was disappointed, and I think I talked about this in the first or second slideshow, uh, that our canopy was, is pretty much going to be dominated, but it's going to be dominated by a maple, which is a dynamic accumulator of potassium, birch trees, which are dynamic accumulators of potassium, and they're all really useful plants. Uh, so not only are they producing a lot of biomass and structuring the soil for us, uh, providing really nice shade with our really hot summers for any sort of annual crops we want to grow, uh, but they're also helping to retain nutrients. I mean, you can't really beat that. Uh, and the willow tree may not be a dynamic accumulator, but at least 
it's uh, useful for its rooting hormones that we can make from it, as well as pain relief. Uh, you know, chewing the bark is that's where we got aspirin from, and it still works. I've, I haven't tried it. I usually don't get too many headaches anymore, but hey, I mean, it's here's here's a willow up close. It's leafing out. Uh, you, you never really want to trust willows uh, for whenever springs around, but in this case, they were pretty much right. Um, Here's that birch tree taking center stage, you know, sitting there accumulating phosphorus during the growing season for us. And then when it sheds its leaves, or whenever we chop any little branches off, we're getting an extra dose of phosphorus. Uh, second swale is full, which is always good. Second swale always fills, at, fills after the first one, um, which is, you know, this kind of makes sense. But it's it's always a really good feeling to walk out your door and see that your water harvesting techniques are working. Next photo, you know, here's that first swale full. Um, not taking it just to show the swale, but on the down side of the swale on that berm, where we only had two comfrey plants the first year, uh, every place that we've put a bamboo stake without string tied around it, of course, is another comfrey cutting. So there's going to be one, two, three, four, four, five, six on the downslope, and then there's one comfrey that's uh, adjacent to the swale in the back there. And comfrey, of course, is one of the best dynamic accumulators around, um, withstanding cutting very well, as well as having these really deep roots that bring up potassium, phosphorus, calcium, copper, iron, and magnesium, all in one plant along with being an excellent nectary plant. So if you're not chopping and dropping it all the time, it still can provide something else as well as having just, oh, it's just got to be one of those must-have plants. If it grows in your zone, if you get some Russian comfrey in there, uh, that's just exactly what you need. Here's closer up of the second swale. And look at how many bamboo stakes are on here. Uh, you know, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's probably at least 20 because right where all those water pools, I also pretty much made a bed of comfrey. There's like seven or eight more comfrey cuttings growing up in there. And again, the reason why you want comfrey on a swale is that they, in order to produce the amount of biomass that you're looking for, they need access to a lot of water. So it makes sense to put them down the slope of a swale. And secondly, all those, I just told you how it accumulates at least six nutrients very well. Uh, so, and a lot of these are water soluble. Uh, so when they move through the system and it's the, the water trying to flush out your fertility, um, whenever it's, you know, once spring comes around all the way to late fall, we've got comfrey growing and it's accumulating that and it's biomass. Uh, Nutrient netting, that's what it is. We're netting nutrients whenever possible. Let's see if there are any other. Here's, uh, again, just some more pictures. That we, we've pretty much seen uh, everything already more than once. Uh, but yeah, here's those horsetails in the, in the foreground here, along with comfrey and along with uh, some clover fixing nitrogen. Uh, it's not you know, the most thought out polyculture, but it's a nutrient accumulating polyculture. And that was the 28th of February. There's the 29th of February. We've got crimson clover clumps. This is a really dark green uh, clumps that look like clover. Then all the purple, uh, those are dead nettles. Or, you know, we know that's whenever we see these flush out with the mass amount of flowers. They come around the same time as the willow, and that's that's when spring's a couple weeks away. Um, you know, they, they're one of the first plants to come to life. Although we do have, there's four or five other plants that flower throughout the winter here, um, which is, along with chickweed. So whatever insects are out, that's why the ladybird, uh, I'm sorry, the ladybug, going all British on you now, that's why the ladybug, uh, was able to be out and about. He, he had food. There was nectar available when he couldn't find any sort of insects to eat. So uh, allowing nature to do its thing and fill in, allowing nature to fill in niches with maybe undesirable species, but if you don't have anything else that you're putting there, why not? Uh, things are looking really good in this picture. 
really pleased with our overwinter growth. Let's move on to the last little bit here. Uh, this is the 1st of March. Let me check our time. We've got about five minutes left, which is pretty good. It's probably one of the sharpest pictures you're going to see. Here's a Dacon radish. It's not a nitrogen uh, you know, fixer. It's not a dynamic accumulator, but it is when they do grow to their appropriate size. This is really small. You can see how small that little root is. They're supposed to get probably five times the size. It's a large amount of biomass that they're inserting into the soil, and they'll sometimes go down two feet, and they can get huge. So they're really good for introducing uh, deep organic matter uh, you know, naturally by just growth. So even though these weren't really big, they were going to bolt later on in the season. So I can expect that this fall we should be seeing daikon radishes throughout the garden, uh, which is exactly what we want, allowing them to keep hitting, you know, keep hitting that clay. I mean, they'll, they should get a little bit bigger each year with the nutrients that we've, we're adding uh, with the mulch and everything. They should be able to really bust up this clay so that in the future, when we're done cover cropping and we decide to add in those high value crops, we have good, loose, healthy soil for them to grow in instead of sticking them into this clay right now. I mean, if a daikon radish can't grow, uh, I'm not going to put in a $20 pomegranate and, you know, say good luck to it. Um, those are things we want to put in once and know they're going to survive. And you can see it's surrounded by, at the bottom right, there's a dynamic accumulator of chickweed. You've got its clover around it. There's henbit. It's a really healthy polyculture. Um, here you can see some of, I think I've already talked about the alfalfa. Uh, lemon balm is also available in this picture. So is red clover. Um, comfrey, you can see the comfrey center right by the bird feeder, that big black patch. That's the comfrey. Um, what else? We do have sorrels and docks, which hopefully I'll get to those. You've seen them already, especially the docks. But sorrels and docks, which are of the Rumex um, species, they are also absolutely fantastic. Potassium, phosphorus, calcium, iron, and sodium. I mean, these are plants that a lot of people try to get rid of. They're healers. That's what people talk about. You can read the land, and a lot of these Rumex species are going to show up in acidic soils like we have. You can't grow a lot of your desirable crops in acidic soils, but what these plants are going to do by adding all of these nutrients and their organic matter, they're going to buffer that pH to allow other species to move in. It's called succession. What else can we see in this picture? Uh, dandelions, not so much in this picture, but of course we have dandelions. They're also one of the best dynamic accumulators, as well as an early nectar species for your bees and everything. Potassium, phosphorus, calcium, copper, uh, I'm mean, sorry, uh, cobalt, and uh, iron. I think that there's a miss, there's a mistype on this, um, on this table here. Maybe I should go and address that right now. Uh, CO is, let me see, it should be copper. I'm not sure why that's not coming up. Ba -ba. Yeah, okay, yeah, copper is CU while CO is cobalt. Um, on the Edible Forest Gardens dynamic accumulator sheet, we've always read that horsetails accumulate copper. And on their sheet here, it says that it accumulates cobalt. It says CO. I think that's a pretty common mistake, I would imagine. So the copper and cobalt accumulators, um, I think, are mixed. I think they said, oh, CO, that's copper, CU, that's cobalt. And they've been flip-flopped because there's a whole lot more copper accumulators here than there should be. Uh, well, that's just a little typo that I've noticed or I assume it's a typo, um, should probably raise that on one of the forums, because I saw Eric Tonsmeyer on Permies just yesterday. Uh, here's another view of the garden, wide angle shot, uh, the willows coming out, everything is greening up. I just love spring. I think everybody loves spring. You know, you, I don't, if you don't like spring, there's got to be something, something wrong with you. Um, lots of growth. Here's the blueberry bush that we showed at the first pictures. Uh, look how 
well, it's coming along. It's just moving along. Uh, all the blueberries came out at different times, which is kind of nice because that tells me that they should be different varieties. So their ripening times will probably be different, but we'll see as time goes on. Here's the last picture from this day. Uh, the lighting just gets so much nicer in the spring. Um, kind of harsh, kind of harsh actually with all the white here, but the clumps are getting bigger. The clumps are getting bigger, and I can't wait to talk about spring with you guys. Here's the second. Um, remember I patched up these swales, and now the second swale still has the danger of overflowing uh, where it pools the top right corners. It pulls there, like I said, and it go, overflows and just causes tremendous damage. So I actually put in um, like a little monk. Uh, that's a Sepp Holzer idea, although you know, millions of people have used it before. You basically take an elbow pipe and uh, it, wherever its outflow is, you, you're going to have your outflow going to the next part of your water harvesting. But the pipe, uh, the level of it can be adjusted. You can move it side to side. Ours is fixed. Uh, we're, we don't need it to really change too much because this isn't a dam, this isn't a pond. Um, but I had it leveled. I actually did this with my eye. I didn't even take a level to it, which is really surprising. Uh, but I put the pipe in so that just about maybe an inch or so, giving a little bit of leeway, uh, it's about a four inch pipe, giving a little bit of leeway on where it's going to overflow. As soon as it gets about an inch to where it's going to overflow, the water starts pouring into the pipe and out underneath the swale and down to the uh, upper pond. And now we're going to harvest a whole lot more water in the second swale. It actually is going to back up to where I made that type 1 error now. And uh, we're, we, there's almost no risk of an overflow. Uh, we'd have to get a tremendous amount of rain. So we could fix it. We could probably put even another pipe someplace else. Uh, and bring it to the other pond, which would be a good idea. But as you can see, we're doing water harvesting. We're fixing our mistakes and continuing on. Uh, let's jump to the six. So this is the last three pictures. Um, and we will get to the sorrels and docks, showing a little bit of a picture of those. Here's henbit and dead center, dead nettles on the right, chickweed on the bottom, pretty much like a V O. And this uh, green sprig here that's jumping from center to uh, top left. Those are some kind of wild onion, just a native wild onion. Those four plants, I can't tell you how much people hate those plants. People absolutely loathe these plants. I think it's because they believe that with their weed and feed and everything else that they're pumping onto their lawn every year that uh, they've killed all this stuff. And then when early spring comes around and all these plants emerge and they don't have their lawnmower fixed, they don't have any gas or oil in it, and you know they don't have anything to do with these plants come up and they say hey look look at all these flowers we're gonna set seed all over the place and it pisses people off um i love these plants they're all edible um really strong especially that a wild onion is strong wild onion but that makes it a wonderful aromatic pest confuser and look at all the flowers we have just huge huge swaths of these plants growing throughout our garden over the winter providing forage for insects, habitat, they're pumping nutrients, uh, sugars into the soil, keeping the soil alive. L love them. Embrace the weeds. Here's a, I like this picture. It sort of looks like the willow is raining down on this, um, on this little dove that's hanging out by our bird feeder. Notice how the bird feeders are pretty much full. I don't usually put too much in the wooden larger one because rain can get in there. It's not in the best condition. So I don't put too much in there, but the other one's full. That's because we had such a mild winter, birds were able to find forage, find their seeds and everything that they want to eat over the winter uh, without having to deal with the cold temperatures, reducing their energy levels, and uh, there's no snow cover, so a lot easier to find. So we, 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 love the, we love the doves, we love them coming out. Uh, we were kind of sad that we didn't get all that manure that we usually would have, uh, but at the same time, you know, we understand that they want you know, fresh food and not stuff that comes out of a bag, um, which is also why we're planting a lot of sunflowers and stuff, so that we're increasing the amount of food that we're growing for them over the winter by ourselves. You know, he's sitting on a perch here. He's perched right in this comfrey bed that I talked that I put. This is where the water overflows from the second swale. 
and all these bamboo stakes signify where I put more comfrey. So you put your bird feeders where they're going to bring their manure, concentrate your manure on your dynamic accumulators so that you're fer naturally fertilizing your mulch plants. They're not, you know, putting their feces on edible plants, although comfrey is actually pretty edible from what I understand. There's, uh, but let's not get into that. They, they're going to fertilize them for you. So as you cut them, they're going to have more nutrients in them than they would have if you, they had just been relying upon the water-soluble nutrients and their own mining abilities. Stacking functions. Move these around. We have comfrey everywhere. Move them to comfrey patches. Feed your comfrey. Feed whatever, whatever species you use in your garden. You want to make sure you feed, uh, feed those. Hey, here's that southern, and there's more comfrey planted in this, in this mound. This, this is one of the better hue culture mounds in terms of position because it gets a lot of sun. Even in the summertime, this gets a lot of sun. Uh, we've got kale growing on it. But the other green, large leafy, those are, those are docks. Those are some kind of uh, dock. And as I just read out to you, how much they accumulate. Um, wonderful, wonderful. You know, just, uh, it's hard Sometimes it's hard to convince people of this, but because yeah, they're not really pretty, they don't. These this species doesn't really flower; it just puts up these seed heads that are really kind of nasty, and it sends out uh, underground runners, pops up a couple feet around from where it is. But we just keep chopping it, chopping it, and dropping it. Uh, not chopping it too much to kill it. We don't want to kill it yet. Uh, we're we're still in the mood to have it do its thing uh, in terms of bringing in biomass for us. But it is what it is. Um, what else can I, this is the last picture, what else can I say, I'm going to run through this list real quick of dynamic accumulators, so we've talked about maples, we, I think we may have talked about yarrow, I know I did in the first try on this, but yarrow, potassium, phosphorus, and uh, should be cobalt, not copper, it says it accumulates copper, but I'm pretty sure it's cobalt, um, getting that flip-flop thing, so yarrow not only being a specialist nectary, um, very prolific producer and of course all these dynamic accumulators are very prolific like I said because they have this ability to bring in these hard-hitting nutrients really well so use that that problem as your advantage and keep chopping them uh, birches phosphorus chamomile German chamomile anyway potassium phosphorus and calcium the big three we have those growing underneath the oak tree and we've since transplanted them since they don't grow later on in the spring when they get shaded out, but there was a good nursery for them. Uh, so now we're just taking cuttings and just shoving them all around the garden. They're also pretty foot tolerant. Hey, so another another thing with a white clover is a good uh, lawn substitute, the two of those. Uh, we also have horsetails growing, which is um, calcium, uh, co should be copper, it says cobalt, but it should be copper, iron and magnesium. Uh, we do have strawberries now, which uh, are nice evergreen ground cover that accumulate iron. Um, moving down, lupines. We have lupines now, nitrogen fixer as well as phosphorus accumulator. And we're going to show. I'm going to show you pictures of all of these, but I just want to run through everything that we have growing right now. Um, Medicago sativa, which is alfalfa. Talked about that iron, nitrogen fixing, Melissa officinalis. Um, a thick analysis. I'm just sounding really like I took my Latin classes a long time ago. Uh, lemon balm, which is phosphorus. Uh, moving down from there, we have black locust now, Robinia pseudo acacia, which is you know a very wonderful nitrogen fixing tree, but also an accumulator of potassium and calcium. Excellent. The sorrels and docks, um, Comfries, chickweed, dandelions, clovers, stinging nettles. We have stinging nettles. They accumulate sulfur. One of the few plants that we know that does a really good job of accumulating sulfur. So wonderful to have. We're going to plant those out back. I'll show you what we're going to do with that. Um, and then, of course, vetches. We have the vetches planted. So we have, we're, we're going through this appendix that's provided to us in edible forest gardens, and we're choosing appropriate species to remediate the property by accumulating biomass and holding nutrients. Um, maybe in spring, once the flowers come out, I'll go and talk about our uh, nectary table. But I think that's a lot of information, a whole lot more information than I'm used to including. I really enjoyed doing it. It was a lot better than just you know showing you what's in all these pictures. Um, so we're going to end it there. It's probably closer to 40 minutes. Uh, we'll find out when I press the stop button, but I think that's going to be a good... Um, 
a better slideshow than they usually are. Thank you for listening.